I'm going to endeavor to uh, hit 1 John 4 and finish it tonight. Um, but I want to answer a question. Someone texted me today. I didn't get a chance to reply to them. And so I, you try to reply to all my texts. If I ever don't reply to you, it's not because I'm ignoring you or don't like you. Uh, well, it might be because I don't like you, but it's not because I ignore you. It's, it came through when I'm driving and I'm on the phone with somebody or it just gets buried under a hundred other texts. I'm like you, you know, you're talking and like text comes through. Oh, I can't reply to that right now. So I'll get back to it. And then 40 texts later and you're laying down at night and you think, oh, who is that? That was an important text that I should have replied to. I'll tell you something Miss Manna does. You can tease her about it. We'll be praying together or talking about something and she, <laughs> she'll say, remind me to tell you something. I said, okay. And then she'll hold a finger up and I'll say, what is that? She said, that's to remind me to tell you something. And I said, that's going to remind you. Yeah, it will. And you know, 30 minutes later, her finger's still up. And I was like, what, what'd you want to tell me? Did you need to hold two fingers up? I mean, just... <laughs> So at the end of the day, like, oh, there was somebody I was supposed to text back. Who was that? Who was that? So anyway, uh, <laughs> let me get to this question here. Go with me to 1 Corinthians, uh, and then we'll answer this question about was Paul being a hypocrite? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, this question is, um, they, they said, I've read it several times, and I keep seeing Paul as a wolf in sheep's clothing. Well, there's going to be a problem if you're reading a Paul's teaching and you keep reading that maybe he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. We want to clarify that. And I don't knock this person. I appreciate their honesty. They're in here. And so I, this teaching on this passage would help every one of us. It, and it's a fitting passage. Um, anyway, they go on to say, if you act like us only to point out our flaws later, weren't you just as bad during this sneaky waiting time? So 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is what we want to look at. I'll read it to you. In um, New Living Translation, if you want to pull it up on Sky Bible or Bible app, or whatever. So let's start in verse 23. It's always, uh, if one verse throws you off, don't just stop there. Back it up and get a running start. See what the context is. So he's talking to the Corinthians. We know they're a carnal church. They are spiritual, but they're also carnal. They're in the middle of Greece. So you have a lot of paganism going on. There's a lot of idolatry. There's just a crossroads of all sorts of Greco-Roman weirdness. And yet Paul has a church there, and he's trying to help them navigate a lot of things. So in verse 23, he says, You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. And this is a good explanation for us. Just because we can do it doesn't mean we should. I think every parent gets that with their kids. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Verse 24, don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. Now, prior to that, he's talking about uh, eating the meats that were sacrificed at demon altars. And he says, listen, the altar is nothing. And the meat is nothing. The offering is nothing. But what the pagans sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils. And I would not that you had any fellowship in devils with devils. That's King James. So then he says, you, look, you say you can do anything, but that doesn't mean you should. And I had, I've shared this before, but I only have so many stories. We were in South Africa at a Hindu temple. And I actually got to watch somebody go and present an offering to the Hindu altar outside. And they really do have a bunch of gods. And they had a bunch of little temple shrines all around the temple for every god. And I think this was the god of the four corners because they had a little idol pointing in all four directions. And I walked up, after they left, I walked up to this little altar shrine. And it was a concrete statue of a little um, elephant god. And it was only about this big. And it honestly looked like it had been cast along one of our interstates here and you know, 127, where they make those concrete angels and concrete giraffes and, you know, yard gnomes. But this was not a yard gnome. This was a yard demon, <laughs> a, little, a little chubby elephant and uh, painted pink with a red hat and a blue tassel. And it was sitting like in the lotus position, but it's made out of concrete. And then it was sitting on a little concrete altar that had like bathroom tile. So you could tell it was a homemade job. 
They did a good job, but it was still homemade. And then in front of it was simply a plate of food. And the plate of food was rice and beans and bananas. And I looked at that, and this is the verse that came to my mind. The altar is nothing. The idol is nothing. The offering is nothing. And I thought, that food actually looks pretty good because I like rice and beans and bananas. And I really thought to myself, I could eat this, and it's not going to do anything to me. But they've offered it to their demon. And so Paul's saying, listen, you're living in a region with a lot of demon worship, and everybody knows demon worship goes on, and everybody knows this meat is regular to being sacrificed unto demons. And so now we have to be very careful of what we're doing. That's the context uh, verse 20 then goes on to say, uh, excuse me, uh, verse 24, don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. Now he's talking about the conscience of people. And the whole passage here is conscience. Verse 25, so you may eat any meat that is sold in the marketplace without raising questions of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Now, this comes back to a cultural understanding. In these temples in ancient Greece, uh, they would offer offerings, sacrifices, burnt offerings unto these Roman gods. And then they didn't just throw them away because you, you don't only burn it. You got a whole a queue of people burning these animals. You would then take it out the back door of the temple and sell it at an outdoor meat shop that they were called, the King James word for it's the shambles. So you actually are like accomplishing two things. You're financing your temple by selling meat out the back door. There's nothing wrong with the lamb or the goat or the cow or whatever it is, but it's been sacrificed to Zeus or Delphi or whatever. And then you take it off the altar because you can't leave it there all day because somebody else is in line behind you. And now you go and you sell it. And that's what he's saying. You may eat any meat that is sold in the marketplace without raising questions of conscience. What questions? Uh, did did that one over there, was that on the altar to Zeus? Do you have any GMO-free, free-range, Zeus-free, <laughs> Oracle Adelphi-free? We got any Mars-free chickens? You got any demon-free cows? Don't ask questions, because in the end, it's just food anyway, right? In the end, it's not going to do anything to you, because there's no power in it. It's just roasted animal. For the earth is the Lord's and everything's in it. You can offer it to a demon, but it still belongs to God. He still made the cow. He still made the fire. He still made the wood you made the demon altar out of. It's all still his, even if you pervert it. Because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Verse 27. If someone who isn't a believer asks you home for dinner, accept the invitation if you want to. Eat whatever is offered to you without raising questions of conscience. Just eat it and don't ask about it. He says, if they're a pagan and they want you to come over for dinner, take the invitation if you want to. He's answering questions about how they're to walk out their Christianity in the midst of a very pagan nation. Pagan asks you over for dinner, go. And don't ask any questions. Because if we start asking questions, things start getting awkward for everybody involved. If you've ever been to the developing nations on a mission trip, don't ask questions just eat. Just don't even ask. My rule of thumb is only take meat that has a bone in it. That's my rule of thumb because that's guaranteed to be muscle, not kidneys, not livers, not lungs, not heart. And I've accidentally eaten most of that overseas. Um, you know, when you've eaten your whole life muscle and then you start chewing on another innard and you're like, this is really spongy. Or this is really irony tasting. Or, that's when you realize I should have grabbed the chunk of meat with the bone in it. Ask nothing for conscience sake. Verse 28, but suppose someone tells you this meat was offered to an idol. So they're serving you at their dinner table. By the way, these wonderful lamb chops, we offered this to Zeus yesterday. You just ruined things. Now what does Paul say? Don't eat it out of consideration for the conscience of the one who told you. Now, here's a rule that the modern American Christian rejects with all passion. And that rule is we do live to please other people's consciences. That's a high order of Christianity because this modern generation is like, who are you to tell me what to do? I don't care what you think. 
but you really do because you got daddy issues. I don't care what you think. Paul commands us. We have to care what people think. By the very fact that they told me this lamb was offered to Zeus, I am now commanded not to eat it for their conscience sake. I now change my whole manner of being to accommodate someone else's mode of thinking. That's a high level of Christianity. I would dare say this nation rejects it because our nation fights for, I can drink if I want to. I can pierce and tattoo if I want to. I can dress this way if I want to. And to quote Dr. Barclay, okay, sure. Why do you want to? You can do anything you want to. But why do you want to? Why not ask a matter of your own heart? Why? Well, I'm going to eat this lamb chop anyway. Okay, but if it hurts their conscience, why would you? If it's going to hurt your witness, why would you? I'm not sure our, uh, the church has, still remembers what it means to have a witness. Our, our witness, our Christian reputation is a very important thing. It's worth a lot of money and equity in the kingdom. And once you lose your witness, it's really hard to get it back. It ought to be important to us to maintain our Christian witness. And if we ever feel like we've lost some street cred, or we might call it kingdom cred, we should really go about <clears throat> seeing what we can do to earn it back if we've, we've hurt somebody. Uh, of course, it's Olympics right now, so I've been watching a lot of the judo competitions. And when I did judo years ago, I, I broke my nose really bad. I was a youth pastor at the time. And long story short, I broke my nose really, really, really. I was 25. Just want to be clear on that. But I reversed a throw on a guy, and we both went to the mat, and my nose gave him a concussion on his forehead but it also knocked, broke my nose so bad I could see it out of my right eye. And I dropped the loudest F-bomb of my life. <laughs> to a whole dojo of guys I'd been being a light to for a year and a half. And the pain was excruciating. And as soon as the F-bomb went out, more concerning to me was what did I just do to my witness? Now, at the same time, my nose is in my right eye and when I grabbed it and, and popped it back in, it, then it bled a pool of blood about the size of a car tire. And then I'd also cut my nose down to the bone here, lacerated it. Uh, I had to get stitches, had to have my nose set. Um, the first thing I did when I went back to judo the next week was I repented to everybody. And I, <laughs> I said, we, had, we circled up and I said, guys, you were all here and I wanna repent to you for dropping the F-bomb. And they were gracious. They're like, man, I, I, we're surprised that's all you said. Did you see how big that blood pool was? Did you, we're surprised that's all you said. Man, if it was me, I'd still be cussed. And they were all very gracious, but it hurt my heart. But it also let me know it was still in me. I, I, we're so selfish as people now. Like, we don't even care if it offends folks. You're just supposed to accommodate me. Now, isn't that the height of selfishness? That you, I'm supposed to, you're supposed to just know what I need and just get out of my way and accommodate me. But we're doing that in other areas of our life too. We, we live and we think everybody should accommodate us, but that is selfish. It's the height of selfism and it really is carnal immaturity. <clears throat> he says, don't eat out of consideration for the conscience of the one who told you. And we really need to focus on what our, our spiritual credibility is, what our mature credibility is. Uh, when, when you grow up, you want to start carrying yourself with a lot more weightiness, a lot more respect. To be an elder in a local church, the Bible says you have to carry yourself with all gravity. That doesn't mean 9.8 meters per second per second. That means with all venerability. That means your reputation is important to you. And you want to be esteemed as an epistle, a Christian who has a witness, whose life is worth following. That doesn't mean you will make, won't make mistakes, but when you do make mistakes, you just fix it. You go back and repent. You go back and clean it up. A lot of my mistakes in my early 20s, a lot of the most uncomfortable times was going back and making things right that I had made wrong, and it was usually embarrassing and painful, but it was demonstrating that my reputation and my witness was important to me. Um, I just, th these are all youthful stories because at some point you have to be mature enough to, I guess, be a pastor. And since I've been a pastor since 31, I guess by the time I was 31, the Lord said, all right, that'll do. Oh, uh. 
<laughs> Holy Spirit, help him. But there came a time even in my 20s when I, I quit running. I've always been a runner, but I quit running with my shirt off because it, it, you recognize it can be a stumbling block to women and now to guys. Actually, even since I've been a pastor, I used to run at Tech, still do sometimes, and somebody had my number, a guy had my number at Tech and started sending me sexually perverse texts. I saw you running through Tech with those short shorts on, running shorts or short, you're not wearing surfing shorts when you go for a run. And I think I had on, not a tank top, but a sleeveless shirt. And this guy who I ended up, you, I used some connections to pull the phone record to figure out who it was. And it was a homosexual man who we tried to help. He had seen me and he accused me of trying to entice him. And all I was doing was running on tech. So anyway, point is, about 25, 26 years old, I quit running with my shirt off because I didn't want to be a stumbling block. And then one of my friends um, who I was going to church with, he, whenever we'd work out and run, he still ran with his shirt off. You know, we're all in our 20s, so we're all pretty fit. And he's like, that's a little uptight. I was like, listen, it's just my conviction. And honestly, my heart was, you know what? Pastor Vaughn doesn't run with his shirt off. I don't know if Pastor Vaughn runs. I mean, now he doesn't. He's you know, like in the ground. But in those years, he was alive. So I can't imagine Pastor Vaughn running with his shirt off, even if he was in shape. So I'm not going to do it anymore. So my friend, uh, he thought that was a little legalistic, but two or three weeks later, he was uh, working out on North Shore Drive in Knoxville. Kind of there's a trail there. He's doing pull-ups. And he said, he has sunglasses on, and he had a shirt off. He said, I was, he called me up to repent to me. He said, I was doing pull-ups, Chris. And he said, and I watched a husband and wife about our age jog, and I watched the wife stare me down the whole way while she's out working out with her husband. And he said, I get it. I just ruined that woman's heart. And I was the source of stumbling. At some point, you gotta be mature enough to that you start depriving yourself of things you think you do if it hurts people. Part of being a Christian means it's no longer about you. It's no longer about what you want to go see at the movies. It's no longer about what you want to drink. It's no longer about how you want to dress. It's now about what helps the body of Christ. When you're a baby, yes, you poop all over everything and you scream at the drop of a hat. But at some point you grow up and you want to start being an asset to the household. And our modern Christian culture has just taught us that it's still about us. It's how, to have you, how for you to have your best day. And so we've somehow still hoard Christ out to make him our servant. And I reject that as heresy. It's a new gospel, and it's going to send people to hell to the tune of 40,000 people per church. Suppose, verse 28, someone tells you this meat was offered to an idol. Don't eat it out of consideration for the conscience of the one who told you. Uh, I was telling somebody else just recently, so I've been, you know, obviously I fly a lot. I'm always watching movies on airplanes. They used to edit movies. They don't anymore. And I've just learned, don't trust anybody. And I also, I don't sit down next to strangers on airplanes and say, I'm a missionary going to Africa to preach the gospel. You want to talk about Jesus? We have nine hours together. I don't do that. But I'm very mindful of what I'm watching because I've seen people's movies over the shoulder in front of me. And so I was watching something that I assume was edited. It was a movie from the 80s. I was fully expecting it to be a movie from the 80s. And all of a sudden, we're in a strip club. And Lydia's sitting beside me. And I got people I don't know who I may have to talk to in three hours. And I about punched the lady in front of me trying to turn that screen off because what I'm watching affects people around me. And it could absolutely kill my witness. So just because you're an adult doesn't mean you should watch adult movies. I was also telling somebody else years ago, I was in line to go see the, one of the Bourne movies, Bourne Ultimatum, Bourne Supremacy, Bored to Death. I don't know. It was one of those Bourne, I uh, can't carry a camera to save my life because it's a shaky cam. And I happened to recognize the guy in front of me who was one of the big charismatic pastors in town. And my radar's up, and I'm like, what are you going to go see? I'm going to judge him. 
born ultimatum. I'm like, well, we're all in good company here because you're going to see the same movie I was going to see. But if he was going to see something dirty, I wasn't going to tell him I knew who he was. I was just going to have no esteem for him. But he was going to see just a good action flick with Matt Damon saying three words the whole movie, which is about as many as he can say. <laughs> he never knew I knew who he was. This is why it's important we are mindful of how we carry ourselves in our culture. How we live is supposed to be different than how the rest of the country lives. How we carry ourselves, how we eat, what we drink, what we watch, how we dress. There's supposed to be a distinction. Now, to watch the modern church, there's no distinction, not even in their architecture or their stage production. But there's supposed to be something different between the children of God and the children of everything else the world coughs up. So we need to start looking for a place where we can be more different than our neighbor. All right. Verse 29, it might not be a matter of conscience for you, but it is for the other person. It may not violate your conscience, but it can totally destroy their conscience. So we have to live this gospel with other people's conscience in mind. For why should my freedom be limited by what someone else thinks? That's the American idea. Why is my freedom limited by what you think? If I can thank God for the food and enjoy it, why should I be condemned for eating it? Well, the answer is, because these are hypotheticals, is that we want to win as many people to Jesus as possible. We want to win as many people to Jesus. We don't want to be the stumbling block. We don't want to be the reason they call the church hypocrites. We want to be the exception to the rule. Even for, like, for this election cycle, the reason I won't vote for Trump is for conscience sake. I've been able to witness to so many people and ingrain, gain so much credibility by telling folks I'm a pastor, I'm evangelical, I'm conservative, and no, I don't support Trump. And that gives me access to people I could not gain access to being a stereotype. Verse 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Verse 32, don't give offense to Jews or Gentiles or the church of God. Three categories of people that you have to consider in your day-to-day -day life. And these are the only three categories of people in the whole world. Jews, everybody who's not a Jew going to hell, and then the church, born again, and then those who are not born again that are Jews or Gentiles. So all you have to do is worry about everybody's conscience. And that's called Christian maturity. Pastor Vaughn was of a conviction in his early years that, that he wouldn't even drink uh, root beer out of a glass bottle because it looked like real beer. That's a high conviction. Well, it's not a real beer. I remember uh, when I backpack in Maryville or Smokies, I go through Maryville, and I always like to get the cream sodas. But the cream sodas, like the old school cream sodas, they look like the beer and they come in like old container. But I have to make sure I'm out of town and I make sure everybody can see it's cream soda. So you kind of carry it like a moron like this so everybody can see IBC cream soda because it ain't Corona. Because my witness is more important to me than my ability or desire to drink some liver buster. Amen. We, we're just so flippant, and we honestly think everybody else should be more mature than us. Well, if they can grow up, why can't you? Why do we expect them to grow up? Why do we expect them to get over? Why can't you be the big one? Don't give offense. So this is the question. We don't want to offend people's conscience. When I travel, especially overseas, I always ask questions. What do you want me to cover? What do you not want me to cover? What do I need to stay away from? Last time I was in Iceland, longest sermon I've ever got to preach in Iceland, it was like 35, 40 minutes with translation. And I end up saying something about spanking children. And I ended up offending the culture because it's against the law to spank in Iceland. And so Parker said, I said, how'd I do? He said, oh, you did fine. You did great. I, he said, you know, you touched on spanking and they don't do that here. And I said, I, 
I am so sorry. He said, ah, they know you're an American. He said, listen, we're British. We beat our kids too. He said, but we just can't touch that here. They'll extend grace to you because they understand you don't know the culture. So there was a permission that was ignorant. But if I go back again, I'm not going to double down on that and drive it home. It's not my problem to fix. There's other things to preach without having to get hung up on that. Likewise, if I, if I go to Africa or new cultures, I'll say, what do I need to touch on? What do I need to avoid? What do we need to leave alone? When we preach for the scudders, Brett, what do you want me to touch on? What needs to be hammered out here? What do we need to leave alone? We want to make sure that we help people. And if you, you guys know how it is, you're, you're offended. You're easily offended. Once you get offended, you're shut down. That's our culture. Just, and we may never get you open again. And if our job is to go about winning as many people to Jesus as possible, then why are we purposely touching all their triggers and then expecting them to be the bigger person? And then on the flip side, you triggered me. All right, you hypocritical retard. That's what you, your existence is a trigger. Like, you, you just walk through life and you offend people and yet you have to wear a sign that says triggered easily and you want us to tiptoe around you? Of course we will because you've been trained to be special needs in your head. You don't have to be, but you choose to be. We have to, like Dr. Barclay says, have really thick skin and a really tender heart and not be the reverse, which is what the modern culture is. So super thin skinned and super calloused in heart so that we're easily offended because everything permeates us. If we're gonna be mature, don't give offense, verse 32, to Jews, Gentiles, or the church. That's just everybody on planet earth. And we ought to be really good by this point in our culture to know how to accommodate and adapt to people for the sole purpose of getting them the gospel. Verse 33, I too try to please everyone in everything I do. Now he's speaking to conscience. I try to please everybody in everything I do as opposed to vi violate their conscience, offend them. He says, I don't just do what is best for me, which is the, in our sense, that's the American spirit. It's me, 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 me. I don't just do what is best for me. I do what is best for others so that they may be saved. When you go into other cultures, um, even I've witnessed to international people, and there's a couple stories I have, but they're too long and too detailed. At, at some point, you've taken them as far as you can for the time being. So there's a whole other room of their life that's a mess and you have to say in your heart, that's enough for now. Well, there's plenty of time to deal with that. There's certain things you just look past. Uh, with certain people I get to have influence with now, I have lunches regularly that are full of expletives and foul language. It doesn't bother me a bit. I do remind them I'm going to pray over this meal, so let's bow our heads. And they'll bow their heads, we'll pray, and then we go back, well, not we, they go back to cussing. It doesn't bother me a bit. There's other things to work on. If we're going to be effective witnesses for Christ, it can't be about us, our culture, our wants, our carnality, our immaturity. If we're going to win people to Jesus, we're going to have to really adapt ourselves to a lot of people if we're going to win them. And that just takes maturity. Uh, I mean, honestly, if we wanted to jump over to Romans, Romans covers this in another place here. Uh, Romans 13, if you want to go there. Actually, Romans 14. So I'm not sure if that answered my person's question. I do what is, is best for others so that many may be saved. It's not about being a hypocrite or being a chameleon. It's about adapting yourself to people. Like even as Paul did at the Oracopus, Mars Hill, he said, hey, I uh, saw a statue to the unknown God. He didn't bash the other 700. He said, let me tell you about this one. I know him. <laughs> I know that God. And he gives them the gospel, the resurrection. And it converts half the crowd by not bashing things that needed to be bashed, but by finding some common ground where he could adapt himself to the Gentiles present. 
And he says, to the Jews, I became as the Jews. To the Gentiles, I became as the Gentiles. I became all things to all men that I might win some, yet not without the law to Christ. So he didn't violate the law of Christ. Romans 14, uh, let's read that in the New Living Translation as well. I don't think I've ever looked at this in the NLT. I'll just trust it. Verse 1, accept other believers, that is to accept them, not accept them, accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. So now we're dealing with conscience again. They're babies. Just come on in. Let's fellowship. For instance, I like that. Let's have an example, Paul. One person believes it's all right to eat anything. But another person, another believer with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. They had vegans in the first century. What is right? Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. So don't think you're better than a vegan. And if you're a vegan, don't think you're better than normal people. <laughs> uh, verse 4. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall, and with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. In the same way, some think one day is more holy than another day, while others think every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced that whatever, uh, whichever day you choose is acceptable. We're not even going to split hairs on what the Sabbath is. I don't understand why the Seventh-day Adventists can't see that verse and say, hey, look, we're just glad you Sunday churchers go to church. I used to work with a Sunday or Saturday churcher. He would call me a Sunday churcher. And he had a very foul mouth. And uh, he, would, he would call, I mean, he was younger than me by about 10 years, but he would call me Sunday churcher. And he knew I was a pastor. And I said, so, really foul mouth. I said, so how does this work? You can cuss like a sailor as long as you go to church on Saturday? Is that how it works in your denomination? I mean, you can just live like a pig so long as you show up for Saturday church. And he, he said, point taken. Because his denomination doesn't support foul mouth, but he thinks he's righteous because he goes to church on Saturday. So then he and his wife wanted to double date. I said, his name's Ken. I said, Ken, this is hard because, look, you can't do anything after sundown on Friday. So how are we going to double date? Because that's date night. He said, we can do it after the sun goes down on Saturday. I said, well, I got church the next day. So why can't you just change denominations and be normal like the rest of us? <laughs> so we actually, as I recall, we went to their house, but we had to be gone by sundown on Friday. So we did it in the summer when you have more light. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Those who worship the Lord on a special day do it to honor him. Those who eat any kind of food do so to honor the Lord, since they give thanks to God before eating. And those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and to give thanks to God. Listen, be a vegan, but thank God for the food. Be a carnivore, omnivore, herbivore, I don't know, velocivore. Be what you want to be, but give thanks for it. And quit being a snob about it. I don't know why vegans got to tell everybody they're a vegan. Is it like, so your food fluid now too? I mean, sometimes you all this personal identity, it's just ego and selfism. If you got to be a vegan, be a vegan. If you got to be a vegetarian, be a vegetarian. If you want to be an omnivore, herbivore, carnivore, be whatever. Be all that you can be. Join the Lord's army. Amen. Give thanks for it all. Some of you are like, I'm a sugar vore. I just eat sugar. <laughs> Just give thanks to God, verse 7. For we don't live for ourselves and, or die to ourselves. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. And if we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we die, we belong to the Lord. Uh, Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, to be both Lord, both of the living and the dead. Verse 10. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For Scripture says, all, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow, uh, bend to me and every tongue will confess and give praise to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. Now we're back to the conscience. that begins by saying, receive those that are weak in the faith, but not to doubtful disputations. For one who is weak, believe that he can only eat 
plants. Another who knows better can eat all things. And now we're back to don't cause another believer to stumble. Verse 14, I know I'm convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in and of itself is wrong to eat. No food. That includes animals. This is an important issue because now we're, the American church has got bored with God and now we're into creation stewardship, which means we've got to save the planet and be beyond conservationists and now I guess be Gaia earth worshipers. And now some say we shouldn't even eat animals because you know they're God's creatures too. Well, in order for you to live, something has to die. And Paul says by the Holy Ghost, there's nothing wrong in eating anything. Okay? But if someone believes it is wrong, then for that person it is wrong. That's the power of conscience. Because you can't move them off their conscience. This becomes the person we have to adapt to. This is the person who, verse 1 says, is weak in their faith. And we have to adapt for that. And if another believer is distressed by what you eat, you are not acting in love if you eat it. Don't let your eating ruin someone for whom Christ died. Now, how about we apply that to drink? We, we're not quite to the point of food idolatry in America yet, but the way we're loving animals like family members, it won't be too much further till we're that way. They're already telling us we shouldn't eat cows because they pass gas too much and burn holes in the ozone which apparently is why God killed the dinosaurs because they were very flatulent. It's a joke, but like we've always had animals. They've always passed gas because they're always eating grass and we're just now having global climate change. How about we apply it to drink because that's the big issue here in America. So let's put the word drink in there. If another believer is distressed by what you drink, you are not acting in love if you drink it. Honestly, my heart is a little convicted when I get the energy drinks because so many of them look like beer. So I don't kind of parade it, but I'm just like, hopefully they know in this city, if you buy alcohol, it's going in a paper bag. Isn't it amazing they do that to help you hide your shame? Here, put this in this. We know what it is. We know you have a problem, but at least we don't have to look at it. And maybe that bag's to throw up in later. Don't let your drinking ruin someone for whom Christ died. Then you will not be criticized for doing something you believe is good. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink. So now we have permission to include drinking. But of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God and others will approve of you too. So it is important that we have the approval of people. Now, you can't please everybody, but we are called to approve, be approved. Paul said in Corinthians, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. We don't want to be controversial outside the gospel. Now, the gospel will always be controversial, will always stand for holiness. That will always be controversial. But we don't need to be controversial for other petty reasons. What we watch, what we wear. It's not, there's no reason to be controversial. We should say offensive for that. The preaching of the gospel is always going to offend people. We shouldn't live offensively, though. I preach hard against homosexual sin, but I have a lot of gay friends in town. They know exactly how I believe. And yet I wouldn't have a problem having lunch with them because they know I love them and I care for them and that I'll be there for them but I'm still going to preach hard against it and that's still going to be offensive, but I don't have to live offensive. Jesus preached against sin. Then he went home with sinners and had dinner with them on his terms, not theirs. Verse 19. So then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. Don't tear apart the work of God over whatever you eat. Or over what you eat. Remember, all foods are acceptable, but it is, it is wrong to eat something if it makes another person stumble. All food is acceptable, but it's wrong to eat something if it makes another person stumble. So we have to even, this thing is so critical, even down to what we eat, we have to be mindful of what people think. 
This thing is so critical. We have two passages, massive passages in two Pauline epistles that say, if even it's, it's so critical as if to what we drink is regulated by another person's conscience. If it hurts them, we don't have permission. So you can argue Jesus turned water into wine. But this verse deflates you. And we know in our society, our culture, uh, this society doesn't know any kind of self-control. There isn't just one beer. There isn't just one glass of day drinking wine. They got to finish the whole bottle. They got to finish the whole six pack. We have to be better than that. Verse 21, it is better not to eat meat or drink wine. So he deals directly with alcohol or do anything else if it might cause another believer to stumble. You may believe there's nothing wrong with what you are doing, but you keep it between yourself and God. And blessed are those who don't feel guilty for doing something they have decided is right. But if you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something, you are sinning if you go ahead and do it. For you are not following your convictions. If you do anything you believe is not right, you are sinning. So the conscience is a powerful force, and we just need to make sure we're mindful of people if we're going to win them to Christ. And that it causes us to slow down. Let me use a woke term for you. But in the biblical context, decenter yourself. I never thought I'd say that from the pulpit. Please still respect me tomorrow. <laughs> we whites have been taught to decenter ourselves for the last five years. How about we do it from a biblical standpoint? How about we say it this way? It's not about what you want. It's not about what you think you're entitled to. We're here to win people to Jesus. So we have to adapt ourselves to them that we might win the more. Okay, that's, a, that's why I didn't text that answer uh, to their question. Uh, Siri would have just quit on me and said, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm tired. And I said, what? You're a woman's voice. Actually, she just, I just activated her. And she's supposed to be where I just pushed the button to activate her. And apparently she heard her name. Hmm. We have to be mindful of how other people receive and perceive things. We don't have a right to anything. Uh, we have a right to go to hell, and we're not getting that, so we're doing, we're doing pretty good. So let's try to see how far we can get into 1 John. Ben wants me to get it done so he can put it up on the stream or whatever series he's got going, and I may not make it for him tonight. 1 John 4, and I have uh, studied this out in... New Living Translation. So let's transition just a bit here. Maybe we can make it fit what we were just looking at. Verse 1, Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. Well, if that doesn't fit for today. We're in an election cycle. One thing Trump has done is proven everybody's a prophet. Except they're still not repenting for all their heresy from four years ago. Amen. Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. So we should be cautious. Now, our good Baptist brothers, they look at that and they say, why would you? <laughs> John, why did you even have to write this? And I say, come over to Pentecostal circles and you'll totally get it. Because if we're suckers for anything, it's a prophetic word. You must test them. That means every so-called prophet has to submit themselves to the testing of other saints. But one of the indicators that they're not a real prophet is they won't submit. Like if I'm really a prophet, and I've never claimed to be one, but if I'm really a prophet, and I really know my Bible, and I find a lot of major prophets today, or those who claim to be prophets, don't know their Bible at all, then I'm going to fully expect people to criticize my prophecies or my preaching, because that's what the Bible tells the body of Christ to do. I wouldn't want to be a prophet for anything today, but the Bible says we have a more sure word of prophecy. And if I was a prophet, I would be promoting the Bible over anything I have to say because it won't lead you wrong, whereas I might be able to. You must test them to see if the spirit they have comes from God. Well, that tells us there's a lot of spirits out there. Charismatic circles are a cuckoo. 
charismatics have never been known for their wonderful doctrine. We must make sure we make up for that deficiency. Please know your Bible. 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 For there are many false prophets in the world. That's bad. But it also indicates if there's false prophets and there's genuine ones. So how do we know what a genuine one is? Verse 2. This is how we know if they have the Spirit of God. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in a real body, that person has the Spirit of God. Now that's an easy litmus test today because everybody on Christian television who claims to be a prophet is going to claim this. But the context here is... John is beginning to deal with early Gnostic doctrine. So a lot of these statements are aimed at doctrinal disputations that come from heresy. That is lost on us because we don't know Gnostic theology. We don't even know what the Gnostics were, so therefore we don't know what he's answering. So I, I've been in Pentecostal circles to see uh, ministers try to get a demon to say, confess Jesus has come in the flesh, and the demon say, Jesus has come in the flesh. That's not a good litmus test for a demon. He's going to say that. But this is, uh, the Gnostics did not believe that Jesus the Messiah, uh, Jesus the man and, the, and Jesus the Christ were the same. And they made a distinction on it. So this would have been a hang-up point for any of the Gnostics that were working to infiltrate the church and begin to peel them off, uh, the saints off. Verse 3, if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. If anybody claims to be a prophet... Again, a Gnostic prophet, because that's the heresy John is addressing in his day. Uh, if he does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that is, being the Son of God, being divine, that would exclude the Jehovah's Witnesses, because they don't believe Jesus Christ was divine. They believe he was a God, but not the God. Also Mormons. Mormons believe he's one of many gods. He was a created being that became the God of our planet, and if we do right and keep his laws. We get to have a spiritual life and go populate our own planet. It's very cosmic. It's more than just Salt Lake City, Utah, and the angel Moroni and a tabernacle and some good singing. It's demonic. It's crazy. Joseph Smith was an illiterate sex fiend who had 42 or 47 wives and got shot in the stomach. He was lynched over a bad newspaper deal. Some prophet he was when the good folks of Illinois have to drag you out of jail and shoot you in the street. It's not exactly dying for your faith, but exposes how corrupt you were. If someone claims to be a prophet, does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, the person, that person is not from God. Such a person has a spirit of antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. That is the spirit of antichrist, that spirit that teaches you to do what you want, when you want, as you want. We teach heavily on the spirit of Antichrist. It's already working in the earth. It's working in the church. We have to resist it. Uh, the, the opposite of the spirit of Antichrist is the fruit of the spirit, the spirit that gives us love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, meekness, temperance, self-control, all this stuff that, that helps us regulate our person. Whereas the Antichrist just says, do what seems right. Do as you will. Drink what you want. Do, dress how you want. Who, those people are just trying to put religion on you. Now listen, if someone has a better way for you, come up better. And if you have to hide it at home and you can't explain it, maybe you shouldn't do it. I get there are some things that are private, like marital intimacy is private. and everybody We already know you're doing it. So you don't have to tell us. But all the other stuff you don't want us to know about, maybe you should stop. Verse 4, but you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. This, the, those people it refers to are the Gnostics that John is dealing with because greater is he that lives on us than he that is in the world. One of our famous passages we love to quote, verse 5, those people belong to this world, so they speak from the world's viewpoint and the world listens to them. It really does concern me that the day that we're living in, the body of Christ now is already dividing again. Following Trump, Trump speaks from the world. Following after Kamala Harris, she speaks from the world. Both of these are worldly people. And I get we kind of have to have a politician, but you don't have to like either one of them or think they came from God. And I'm shocked to watch Christians promote Kamala more than I'm shocked that Christians promoted Trump. 
And I'm shocked to see evangelicals follow Kamala and want to go after her. These people are of the world. And the fact that anybody can cheer behind them, I just wonder what do they have that's ringing out in your soul that makes you want to get behind them? Do you not spend any time in prayer? Do you not see how filthy these people are? Verse 6, we belong to God. And those who know God listen to us. John speaking, not me. If they do not belong to God, they do not listen to us. That is how we know if someone has a spirit of truth or a spirit of deception. That's a bold statement. Preachers can't really say that today. We'll be called a cult leader. But John said, if they know God, they listen to what we have to say. If they don't know God, they will reject what we have to say. Of course, he's a foundational apostle writing by the Spirit of God. Single ladies, that's available right there. That's the mating call of a redneck. Did you hear that? That's the rut. Vroom, vroom, vroom. Classy. (laughs) Verse 7. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another. I love how he moves beyond. Now he goes beyond the Gnostics. Deals with them. They're not of God. Don't listen to them. Now let's talk about us as the church. Those are on the outside, but we can't just always focus on what's on the outside. Now we come back to those of us on the inside. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. The key here is habitually. We all foible, we fall, we get irritated, we get cranky. You, you, even with your family at home, you tell your kids, go to the other room, I don't want to look at you right now. You still love them, and you still get over it. You get mad at your spouse. I can't even look at you right now. Can you go for a ride or I'm going to go on the back deck? Don't follow me. I don't want to see you right now. i got to cool off. The doctor said to count to 100 and 5,000, so i got to go outside and do that. <laughs> But habitually, we're going to reset, say, I forgive you. Do you forgive me? Let's move on. Love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. We are living with the very, in a very vitriolic society. This is one of the reasons I cannot get behind our current politics. It is so vitriolic. It's so hostile. It is, it's, just, it's, not, it's beyond mud raking. It's beyond mud slinging. It is just calling each other the most vile things. Even for the Republicans, I'm disgusted at how much they attack each other. And then they turn around and kiss the ring when they're nominated as VP or when they're nominated as some kind of secretary. and These are not my people. This is not the kingdom. These folks don't walk with my God. I can't be a part of it. I can't associate with it. It's not what I see in Scripture. I know our, our system only gives us two candidates, but you can vote third party if you want and save your conscience. If I just read a bunch of stuff about conscience, I'm going to stick to my conscience. And voting for either one of those two uh, violates my conscience. I I don't judge people. I mean, at this point, if you vote for Trump, I feel like you're just as lowbrow as if you vote for Kamala. I mean, to me, they are are two peas in a pod. One's just a little more conservative than the other. They're both pro-gay. They're both corona shutdown. They're both transgender. They're both pro-abortion. On all the social issues we Christians claim to stand for, Trump is just as secular as the Democrats were five years ago. Uh, so let's just stick with the church. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, verse 8, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now that's not hippie love, it's not homosexual love, it's not tree love, hug and love, it's not rescue puppy love, it's the love of God that hates sin, it's the love of God that lays down its life, it's the love of God that corrects, it's the love of God that rebukes, it's the love that covers the multitude of sins, it's the love that doesn't gossip, it's a love that forgives. It's a love that, that looks for restoration and unity. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that, he might, uh, that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Verse 11, dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. The application is to each other. We have to be able to love within the church. We're not called to love the world. We're not called to lay down our life necessarily for the world. John's just saying, could you at least love each other? 
Let's focus on that. Let's forgive each other within the church. Let's extend mercy and compassion to each other in the church. Let's extend help and grace and poise to each other in the church. If in a local church you can't fabricate or manufacture or develop however you want to, whatever synonym you want to use, if you can't muster love within the church, ugh, it's going to be really hard to argue that you're a Christian. Because he just said, if you love, you're a child of God. We ought to love each other. Verse 12, no one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. I like that. His love is brought to full expression in us. If you're born again and you spend time with Jesus Christ, it ought to be easy to love one another. If you're born again and Jesus Christ lives in you and you fellowship with him, it ought to be pretty easy to find love towards one another. You practice it by praying for one another. I'm glad we don't have a mega church because that would just be a mega problem. But even in our size church, at any given moment, some of you don't like each other. You're irritated at each other. You avoid each other when it comes to picking up your kids because one kid snapped at the other kid and nobody's favoring your kid. And so you feel like everybody's against you. So now you're going to be in a funk like this is middle school. And you can't like go the other way around the lockers because it's a church and you have to kind of ingress and egress in the same bottleneck. So you just act like you don't see them there. How petty is that? Come in late to avoid somebody, leave early, try to get out of service so you can go grab your kid first so you don't have to see the other parent, the woman, father at the checkout station. Let's hurry up, get to the car. That's less than middle school. Because even in middle school, we tell our kids, you're going to have to forgive. And if you don't drop the charges, I'm going to make you write a card and go deliver it to them in person. And if you can't even get over that here, pray for the person and their child because they need it and it'll activate the love of God in you because you need it. There's really two themes in this passage. There, there, here he goes again, girls. You hear that? It's going down to crawl daddies. Two themes to this passage. Adherence to the truth proves you're a Christian. That's verse one. And adherence, manifestation, love pr proves you're a Christian. So if you don't adhere to the truth, and you don't demonstrate love, I don't know if we can say you're a Christian. I don't know if we could defend you. Are they a Christian? I don't know. They go to my church. Yeah, but are they a Christian? I don't know. They're always mad at somebody at my church. They're always talking about leaving. They're always saying, Pastor, I want you to know I forgive you. Well, how magnanimous of you. <sighs> That's a burden relieved that you would forgive me. I don't even know what I did wrong for the 53rd time this month, but I'm glad you forgave me. See, we, we can't prove that you're even a Christian. Well, you, <laughs> you know, Pastor, I, I was really wanting to leave again today. Well, this is the third time this week, three services, so you're batting a thousand. That's pretty good. <laughs> Let's have another service so you can get offended and want to leave that one too. How do we even know you're a Christian when you act like the world? I, I wish at least Christians would get that offended that easily at movies and walk out of movies as easy as they do church services. They'll get offended at announcements and walk out, but they won't get offended at gay porn in a movie and walk out. Oh no, I paid $9 for this ticket. Got to finish it. It's a brilliant society. Verse 13, let's see. We're not going, yeah, we can. We can do this. God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. All who confess that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them and they live in God. So now we have confession. Adherence to truth, demonstration of love, confession of Christ. Proofs and evidences that we're looking for that you're truly born again. Verse 16 we know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love, and all who live in love 
live in God and God lives in them. And yet it brings it back to love. And love forgives and love doesn't quit. Love is not easily offended. Love is not arrogant, inflated with pride. It's not puffed up. It doesn't demand its own ways. It's everything 1 Corinthians 13 says love is. And if you're truly born again, you're walking in that love habitually. And you're getting better at it. You're developing it. You get offended less and less and less and less and less. Maybe it's worth going back and evaluating what still offends you. May all of us, everybody in here, God is so gracious to give you somebody in this church that you hate. <laughs> that is the free gift of God. A fellow sheep you just would like to walk past and kick in the head. <laughs> and God put them here just for you. Just so you could see what's in you. And you ought to give God thanks every day for that that sheep Amen. that you like to kick in the head. <laughs> and the funny thing is you could kick them in the head and they would forgive you right. and probably apologize for getting in your way. <laughs> I'm sorry my head hit your foot like that. <laughs> and that would make you hate them all the more. <laughs> so pinpoint what, whoever that person is, because you're already thinking about the four of them that there are in your own heart. <laughs> What, is, what irritation does that all serve in common or have in common? And that's your problem. What is it that irritates you about them? What is it, what's bringing it, what's bringing it to the, what is it bringing to the surface? And that's what you need to take to the Lord in prayer about. Because the problem is you, it's not them. It's you. And that person brings the worst of you out of you. And for that, you should be thankful. You maybe need to take them out for lunch and bless them. And that way we'll have a weird dynamic of fellowship this week. And all of a sudden, everybody's got new friends in this church. And we might even see a greater move of God because we're not dealing with carnality again every service. Because the church would dwell in unity and not as this cookful facade of Pentecostalism. And man, I love everybody here. No, you don't. I don't love everybody here. I tolerate everybody here. And I pray for everybody here. Everything else we're still working on. <laughs> we know how much God loves us and we have put our trust in his love. God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. And that's the key. As we live in God, that love ought to be growing. When we're born again, we're still working on carnal love. But then we begin to develop a supernatural love in, in accordance with 1 Corinthians 13. And pardon the carnal example, but it is like the martial arts. You get born again and you're a white belt in love. And then as you experience the word of God and practice, you get a yellow stripe. And then God upgrades you to a yellow belt, and then an orange stripe, and then an orange belt, and then a green stripe. You start advancing. And at some point, you should be ranking up in your love walk. Not hippie love. Not Instagram love, not rescue bunnies love, biblical love where you can cover a multitude of sins and absorb a lot of offense because that's maturity. And if we can't even do that with one another who are part of the same body, how will we live when people start coming after us politically, vindictively, because they hate our God and they're of their father, the devil, and we're children of light. How will you be able to weather that when you can't even talk to somebody at the kid's signing table and you're, and you're hoping that one woman is not there? We just come in late because I know she goes to the back after five minutes and we'll sign our kids in with somebody else because I can't stand that one. You can't even handle a church member? It really is shameful. And that causes us to have a right to question your salvation. Because even the world can be polite. Why can't we? We've got to get over ourselves. As we live in God, our I should say this, as we live in God, our love should grow more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. I want to say verse 17 is hopeful faith confessions because I'm not sure it's always accurate in our lives. We, how about I change it just a little bit? But we can face him with confidence because we're endeavoring to live like Jesus here in this world. 
Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. We're afraid we're going to fail. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. We love each other because he loved us first. It may be that you have trouble loving other people because you've never fully received love yourself. I have experienced this in the psychological realm. When you come from a loving home where love and forgiveness and grace and mercy is easily extended to you, it's very easy for you to give that to other people. But when you're, li- when you're raised in a hostile home where everybody has a short fuse and everybody snaps at each other and everybody bites each other's heads off, that's how you're trained to respond. To you, that's normal. That's not normal. That's demonic. It's carnal. It's vindictive. But those who are raised around love, those who are comfortable with love, those who freely receive grace and freely receive forgiveness and freely receive mercy, it's easy for them to like, well, whatever. I'm having a bad quarter. I was going to give him some credit. I was going to say decade. And I thought that was a little too much. And maybe that's the issue because you haven't fully experienced love and know how much God loves you and gives grace and mercy to you. You really have trouble giving it to everybody else. You're still wanting to get your own. You're still wanting to get your comeuppance. We love each other because he loved us first. That comes back to letting the love of God be perfected in you and mature you, develop you. The more you can receive love from God, the more you can give it to your spouse. The more you can receive love from God, the more you can give it to your kids. At some point, whatever's broken in your lineage has to stop. It might as well stop with you and you be a parent your parents never understood to be. Be, be a better parent than your parents could ever have been revolutionize parenting in your home. May your kids be excited to bring you something because they know you're going to say you're proud. And may saying I'm proud be easy. And may say I love you be easy. And may say I'm so happy, I'm so excited for you really, but may that be easy. May saying I forgive you be easy. May saying I'm sorry to your kids be easy. And let your whole household be defined by love and mercy and and compassion and grace. And yeah, we're in trouble, but it's only going to last for a moment. Then we're back to having fun. Mom's not going to play some weird sick psychological game on me for six weeks. And we'll get whipped. Then we're going back to having fun because those brownies are in the oven and they need sprinkles. And yes, I just threw that spatula with the chocolate icing on the wall and mama's not happy. And she's going to whip me with it. And then we're going to put icing on that cake. Let that be your household, not... You're going to the Viet Cong sweat box for four days. Listen, I've pastored in this region long enough to know it is backwards, inbred, and jacked up. And that just describes the former generation that I pastor. (laughs) Weird psychological torture on six and seven and eight-year-olds. Keeping them up till midnight trying to have a talk with them. Just say, sweetie, we'll talk about this tomorrow. Why you got to be such a control freak? Keep them up to 3 a.m. to talk about it. Look, if they're not going to talk to you now, they're not going to talk to you at 3 a.m. They're going to lie. They're just going to make up something. So they can go to bed. That's weird. Why you got to be so controlling? They'll talk when they want to talk. Give them some space. The reason they don't talk is that they're terrified of you. They won't talk because you've bit their head off one too many times and they're not going to stick it out. They're like a little hermit crab and they've drawn in they're like a little snapping turtle and they draw in because they don't want mama to snap their head off or dad to bite their head off. Verse 20, almost done. If someone says, I love God, but hates a Christian brother or sister, especially at the children's church sign encounter, Somehow we've landed on that tonight. Do I need to go there Sunday morning and just stand and ask, are you guys all right? Should I stand on that counter? You, you right with God? You right, you right with each other? You love everybody that works in this department? Do I need to do that? Don't make me do that. <laughs> that <laughs> if someone says, I love God, but hates a Christian brother or sister, that person is a liar. You don't love God. Did you just call me a liar? No, God called you a liar. For if we don't love people who we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? All right, Pastor Caleb just texted me and said, you won't do it. You won't stand on that counter. (laughs) 
watch me with 20 exclamation points. <laughs> Verse 21, as he has given us this command, those who love God must also love their Christian brothers and sisters. Must, 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 must. Your love for God should ought to compel you to pray for that person so that there can be a shift in your heart so you don't see them as the enemy. Don't let it be, because we've all experienced this, don't let it be you pull into the parking lot, see their car, and it ruins your day. Don't let it be. Don't let it, you pull into the parking lot, you're happy not to see their car, only to realize they got a new car. Or they drove the husband's car, or they parked in a different parking lot, or they came in late after you. Anybody ever experience? Thank you, ma'am. All right. One honest church member, and I love her. Miss Flora is one of the few in this church I actually love. I'm serious. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I don't want to be a liar either. Uh, we all know that feeling. What do we do in that situation? You have to pray. The quickest way to tap into the well of love, like an old oil reserve, quickest way to prime that pump and pump it out is to pray for that person. To pray for that person who you can't stand to see coming. To pray for that person you would normally pray wouldn't come to church. Because everybody knows when they're not at church, you can worship God better. Pray for that person. Because if you can manifest the love of God towards them, it's going to fix everything. So here's your assignment. Because we've all got somebody in this church that today they don't irritate you, but it's going to come again because that's who God assigned to you. Start praying for them. And think about this. Let's just say, I don't know, we got maybe 70, 80 people here tonight. I don't know. Let's say we got 70 people here tonight. If half of you had somebody in this church you didn't like, and it was just always kind of simmering there, that's 35 sources of spiritual tumult, a mumbling. If you all went home, all of you could be honest and say, you have a little heart tumult told somebody, and you prayed for them from now till Sunday, we would come back Sunday, and that hum in the spirit would be a lot more peaceful. We'd have a greater spirit of peace and unity in our congregation. Holy Spirit might do something he hasn't been able to do in a while. Everybody claims they want to move with the Holy Ghost, but what if it's your, your angst towards your sister that's preventing it? Yeah. Acts 1 says when they were all in one, Acts 2, one accord, one place, one accord, one place, one accord. That means they're all in unity, all excited to be there, all happy to see each other. It can be obtained if everybody will do what they're trained to do. So if you can be humble to admit there is somebody in this church that gets on my nerves and I don't like standing next to them at the sign encounter. I really don't like it when they're the ones working and I have to put my kids under their care. Listen, we've got cameras everywhere. Your kids are safe. If you can be honest and say that's you, and I'm not going to ask you for a hand, but pray for that person this week. Pray for them every day, morning, noon, and night. Before you pray for your meal, even tell your family, hey, you know what, family? We're going to pray for the Baldwins. Miss Kylie needs our prayers. So does Mr. Kale. So we're going to pray for them before breakfast, at lunch, and at dinner. And that may help you more than anything else we could ever do for you. And that way you come to church and you might actually be excited to have her lead you. If she's the one, I don't know, I'm just making it up. But usually when I make up stuff, it lands pretty squarely in somebody's lap. Pray for whoever it is you can't stand. That's how we manifest love. If you ever struggle with unforgiveness, bitterness, angst, hostility, tension... Pray for the source. Pray for the person who is bringing it. And that prayer is a positive prayer. It isn't, Lord, let them find another church. <laughs> Lord, I know you want them in heaven. Please take them now. <laughs> you know, Lord, you struck some people deaf and mute in the Bible. This could be one of those. The, the prayer you should be praying is, Lord, forgive me. Bless my brother, bless my sister, bless their marriage, bless their finances. Father, I, I pray for them, not against them. Lord, let the blessing of God be upon them. This may be hard to do the first five or ten times because you don't want to bless them. But if you'll do it, it will change things. Amen?
Let's get some unity back in our church. Last week we dealt with gossip. Now we're dealing with disunity. Let's fix this, all right? Let's not live for ourselves. Let's be mindful of other people's conscience. And let's, let's do the Bible basics, all right? Why study Melchizedek if we don't like each other? Why study the Levitical priesthood if we uh, can't stand our sister in Christ to see her kids coming? Let's, let's get back to the basics, all right? Amen? Why don't we stand to our feet? We'll pray and we'll go home. Father, thank you for helping us tonight. We've covered two totally different subjects. Thank you for letting us have the time to do both. I ask you, Father, to help us. I don't know who all is dealing with this, Lord, maybe a handful of people, but may we commit in our heart to pray for that person who is our stumbling block. May we commit in our heart and then follow through and pray for their betterment, pray for their peace, pray for their unity, pray for their blessing, pray that they, that not that they would change, but that they would be blessed and that we would be the one to change. May we see this brother or sister or this kid, this child in Christ. May we see them as our brother, not our enemy. May we see them as a needful hand or foot in the body of Christ, not a cancer. Father, may we see that you have placed them in our life and in this church to bring things to our surface that we would deal with it. May we realize that what we don't like is really what's being brought to the surface in our own life. Thank you, Father, for bringing this to our surface so we might skim it off and do something better. Forgive us, Lord, for our division. Forgive us for our disunity. Forgive us for our offense. May we walk in biblical love. May we truly walk in biblical love. May we truly walk in biblical love, forgiving one another, having heartfelt love one towards another. And Father, I pray for the unity and the peace of Engrafted Word Church. I pray for the unity and the peace of Engrafted Word Church. I thank you, Father, for helping this congregation in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray something together. Pray this after me. Father, Father forgive, me. forgive me. Forgive my attitude. Forgive my, attitude. Forgive my, offense. Forgive my offense. Thank you for changing me. Thank you for, changing me. thank you for the things that come to the surface. They are no longer hidden. They've been brought to the light. Help me skim, skim it off and be a new leaven and a new lump and be pure again. I pray for my enemy. I pray for my brother. And I pray for my sister. Bless all three. I command your blessing on them. Help them. Guide them. Bless them. Prosper them. Protect them. And may your hand be upon them. Bless this church, Lord. Thank you for calling me here. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now to keep